sure, first of all, that it's capable. And it's my responsibility as a developer because adding those extension SDKs was my decision. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's important to remember as well that you're only going to need to use this every now and again. It's about lighting up your app with additional capabilities on particular devices. Most of your functionality, 96% of your functionality, is going to be satisfied by the UAP platform APIs itself, which is the, the huge bulk of everything you're going to want to do in, in the majority of apps. Yeah, you're right. That default UAP really spans across all the devices in a thick way. I mean, there's oh, yeah. a lot of oh, capability yeah. that you already have. Many apps won't even, won't even reference um, extension SDKs, I would imagine. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Yeah. Um, okay, so we saw how we did it in Windows with pound if and all of these other things, but now we see how we did it in Windows 10 and how we can how we can add SDKs, but that doesn't spoil our opportunity to load those and deploy those onto different devices that don't necessarily support those SDKs because we get those kind of stubs or shims that go along with us, and how we can then adapt our code just by using API information to kind of sniff for those capabilities. A lot of power, it's a lot more clean. Um, definitely work for developers to make sure they're not trying to use something that's not really there, but that's what we've been doing all along. Cool, well, okay, that, that was the story of extension SDKs. Uh, go and give it a go, and then uh, come back and join us as we teach you some more great new features in the Windows 10 developer platform. Hi, this is the Developer's Guide to Windows 10 Preview. I'm Andy Wigley, Technical Evangelist out of Microsoft in the UK. I'm Jerry Nixon, also a Developer Evangelist here in the United States in Colorado. Okay, in this session, we're going to introduce you to a brand new control, a XAML control out of the toolbox. This is the Split View. The Split View control is a new control in the XAML toolbox. <laughs> yes, isn't it? And uh, it's kind of exciting, but I think what we'll do is we'll kind of walk through some XAML controls and then go into how and what uh, the Split View actually means to us, right? And it's a pretty exciting control. So before we even talk about the subject of this session, let's talk about some other things. So we know another control we have in our toolbox is also the relative panel, a really important piece of our adaptive story that allows us to arrange items inside a panel based on their relative position to other items in the panel. So instead of giving the top left or anything like that, we say, for example, yellow is to the right of red, and, and then green is below yellow, and we can arrange them relative to other pieces. Very exciting, very good at simplifying your visual tree and, uh, and helping with the adaptive story because we can switch those around in the visual state. Then we also have another control, the month calendar. And uh, so the month calendar, this is a terrific control, not only because we've always wanted it, right? And it's one of those controls that a lot of people build, but also because this is the exact same control we see in the system tray when we're changing the calendar in or the date in Windows. Or it's the exact same one when we look at the touch version of Office and you see in Outlook, this exact same control. So you can trust not only is it a great control, but it's rich as far as capabilities as well. The built-in XAML controls, one, there's, there's a bunch of greatness around them. You know that they're performant, right? Because we use them throughout the operating system. You know that they're scalable, but most importantly, you also know they're properly accessible as well. So you get a lot of candy back for free with uh, XAML controls that you have. So using our controls, seeing more controls showing up in the toolbox, that's just benefit to you. All right, the split view. Now, before we talk about the split view, I think it's important we talk first about the navigation framework inside a XAML application. So we've had the navigation framework since Silverlight, really. Silverlight yep. introduced that to us first. And it's made of two things, a page and a frame. And so if we think about what the frame does, it's just like a browser navigating forward and back through the front forward stack and the back stack. And uh, so it has a series of methods like go back, go forward, can go back, can go forward, and a series of events that you use as well. Um, often, the just navigate alone is the main thing that, that developers interact with, so they can go to different things, unlike uh, Silverlight, where you would navigate to a URI. Here, we navigate to a type, which is brilliant because it allows us to move things around and not worry about the physical location of a file. We can move things through the project that seems more uh, logical and organized from de a developer's point of view. Um, then there's the page. So remember, first it's the frame, and then there's also these pages. The page then has um, a handful of things to it, but the things that are really worth noting here are that they have 
Um, an on-navigated to and an on-navigated from, both of them are an override. So as I, on, as I navigate to a page, go forward, back, or just navigate to a new page, um, on-navigated to is raised for me or, or invoked for me automatically, passing the parameter that's passed in. And so this is terrific, and this is the way most interaction with a page uh, is accomplished. And then there's also navigation cache mode. And so navigation cache mode is very special. You can see there's three, enabled, required, and disabled. And this is basically saying, um, when I come back to the page, does it need to be in memory or do I create a new one from scratch? And so, um, so if, if I say that it's enabled, enabled has a default to it that says, now don't go over the memory limit, right? There's some sort of cache limit and that's set on the frame. And as long as we're under that cache size limit, then um, go ahead and cache it so I don't create a new one. But if I do go over it, Go ahead and take care of memory the right way. Required says forget the limit no matter what. Do not recreate this page. Sometimes that's very important to say required because it can be expensive to create a page. Yeah, so this is performance thing. So yeah, if you come back to the same page, you just get the same instance that you used when you were there before. The default is disabled. So every time you navigate to a page, you get a new instance created every time. Yeah, so if you're at a hub that's expensive to make and you go to yeah. a detail page and you come back to your hub, that hub is recreated every time. Mm. So it's worth thinking whether or not you want to change the cache mode. Yep. All right, so that's the navigation framework. Here's the syntax to do a, a, a navigate. It, it for, so for example, this would be in your app XAML, um, your app XAML CS. On launched, you would, um, you would get the frame, which is a, a nice static value. You can go get it window.current, or you may, have, you may put it somewhere else nested in something, but this is the default location. And then you can decide where it's going to go. So in this case, I'm going to uh, main page, and it's the type that I want. And so I just say frame.navigate type. And I'm passing in null, but that's the parameter that I would pass in. And so uh, MSDN recommends that we pass in a string to that, not an object. But that's where the parameter would go, and then that on navigated to would receive it on the other side. It's a, it's a very straightforward framework. It's very straightforward. Uh, but this is really where, this is, the, this is the context of the split view, right? And so let's talk about the split view control. It's basically just a navigation affordance. It doesn't give functionality that's not already there. It's really giving a UI that um, you would have to build from scratch. And there's a lot of things around that that are kind of frustrating. And this just takes care of it for you. Remember, using our controls give you a lot of capability right out of the box, including things like accessibility and stuff like that. And so let's look at how the split view works. So let's think about first um, where we might see it. So we f sometimes we call it the hamburger menu. You know, because we have those three lines that look like two pieces of bread and meat in the middle, or a veggie burger, a veggie in, the burger in the middle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it shows up on a lot of applications, and when you tap it, different things happen depending on the design of that application. And it's kind of become, I don't want to say it's become a, a, a universal affordance that, that every user knows. Some users, they, they haven't been, you know, that they don't know what to do, and so you need to think about that. Um, but more and more you see it, more and more um, users understand it, kind of just means menu. And uh, so here we are, you, you just tap it and it expands, and then if I tap it again, it collapses. Maybe your application is different and it never expands and never collapses. Either way, it's, it's up to you, but this is sort of the initial layout. And so you can see on the far left, this is the inline or the expanded view, and then we also have this this a compact view, right? This very skinny compact view. So you may go between these two, or you may just stick to one. It's really up to the design of your application. Split view doesn't care what you do. Now, uh, where do you get the hamburger? Well, you'd think three lines would be easy to do, and they actually are, but it turns out we have included it in the new Sago font that's coming, right? And so yeah. you know, we have the uh, Sago, what was the other one called? Sago symbol. Symbol, yeah. Sago symbol. And it had tons of symbols. It was handy. I mean, yeah. they were all vectors, so it was terrific. And so this one, it's not going to be called MDL2, I'll bet, although I don't know. You never know how things lay out. Yeah. But nonetheless, there is another it's a one. New, basically, a new set of, uh, of a new set of coming, symbols. Yeah. Coming coming along. Which and they're all going to look style. like Windows 10. Yep. That that style of Windows 10, and it includes this hamburger button as well. Right. So that's nice. All right. So here's the simplest uh, XAML syntax for the split view. There are two properties that really matter in the split view. The first one is the pane. So the pane is where all the buttons are on the left or right, depending on how you want your application laid out. And uh, so the pane is where you put all of the buttons that they tap. Well, the next question is, what kind of button are you going to put in there? Well, 
in our case, we're going to show a demo in just a second, we use radio buttons because radio buttons do a lot for us. They have full accessibility built in. They have this grouping concept that allows them so that only one can be yeah, checked at a really time. Yeah, it's really nice. You hit one and the others all get unchecked. And so you've got that automatic stuff built in. It's very yeah, handy. No logic yeah. at all that way. Yeah, yeah it gets for um, free. They have accessibility all built in. So what we can do is we can retemplate these ever so slightly and uh, give ourselves the advantage of the radio button with really not having to build our own button. Now, you, uh, we might be tempted to build a user control or something like that, but why when I can retemplate a button that's just dynamite like this? All right, the next really important property is the content property. So first was pane, that's where all the buttons go. The second one is where the frame goes. So remember, this is a navigation affordance and it sits over the frame. So it used to be that we would go to windows.current.content windows and get the frame. Well, if I'm using a split view to wrap the frame, going to windows current.content would actually give me the split view, split view or maybe the page that it's sitting on depending on how I build my tree and so then the frame is a child of the split view so as soon as I introduce the split view I have to start thinking just a little bit differently if there's going to be a, uh, a, um, a simple way to get the frame I might just store a reference in a static variable there's a lot of ways you could do it right and uh, well anyway so we have the pane that has all the buttons and then we have content that holds the frame and the navigation from there. And so Split View does all of the overlay and business like that, so we don't have to worry about Z index or anything like that as well. All right, so those are two important um, of the core properties we set. There are several other properties, like whether or not the pane is open, whether or not the comp or what size the compact length is, um, whether or not it's on the left or if it's on the right. And then we have this idea of pane display mode. And so pane display mode really is a variant of a couple of properties together. Whether or not the pane is open, or whether or not the pane is closed. So the first mode would be inline. And when inline and pane is set to true, then it just takes up space. It's a very wide spot. Your content shifts over and you go from there. But when that pane is closed, everything is gone. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a jolting experience. So you wouldn't probably use inline if you're going to make it so it's, it transitions in and out a lot. But this allows you to have it so it's there all the time and it's the full wide experience as well. But look at overlay. So overlay when it's open, not the same experience. Now my content doesn't shift. It's actually over it almost like a settings flyout was in Windows 8. And so when I, have, I still have that light dismiss so I can tap and it goes away. That's really great. And when it's closed, it's just gone, just like it was before. We have nothing to do with compact in these first two. It's the next two that sort of use that same, this, are almost exactly the same, they just also enable compact. So the first one would be compact inline. When, it's, when the pane is open, it's still, um, it's still the full pane, right? Full width, full width of the pane. Yeah, yeah that yeah. When, I, when we say is pane open, it's never is compact open. This is really talking about the full width pane. So compact true, then it is open. And then when we say compact false, we take away the, the larger pane and it's just the narrow pane. But still in both of those situations, because they're in line, yeah. we shift the content. Right, so then we have this overlay where we may not want to shift the content. So again, inline is probably where you're not having a dynamic experience of open, close, open, close. It's probably just one or the other. And so compact overlay allows us to show the full, um, the full menu, but then when you, the user does a light dismiss, it dismisses to a, um, the compact view. Right, so there's a whole bunch of options here, but hopefully that kind of makes sense. Basically. Um, Pretty it's, flexible, huh? It's a yeah. pretty flexible, right, exactly. We're not saying that your design has to fit blah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Okay, some things that are worth considering um, whenever you choose the split view. Um, uh, maybe you might be using the phone, Andy. You know what I mean? And I like to hold my phone with my right hand um, in just one hand, and so my thumb's down at the bottom. Right. That hamburger menu is often up at the top. Mm, that may not be the best thing. Huh? Yeah, it can, I mean, that may make it really difficult or frustrating, right? Yeah. Uh, there certainly are other platforms that put their menus at the top, and they seem to still be successful. So it's not necessarily a recipe for failure, yeah. but it might make it so that the, your application isn't as easy to use as maybe it was. Nothing stopping you from putting the hamburger button at the bottom. Uh, Moral of that story is just make sure you do usability testing with, uh, with your app and make sure that it gives a good, great user experience to your users. Yeah. Uh, now we, we have the experience of already putting the frame as the base element in our visual tree. And so you might be tempted to have a frame and then a page and then the split view and then a frame inside of that and then only interact with that nested frame but keep the other frame. Now you introduce a lot of complexity, especially when you're talking about um, 
especially when we're restoring navigation state and maybe in the interaction of hardware buttons and the navigation that might be pushed down to frames. So I just want to, a word of recommendation and perhaps warning is not to nest frames. That can really be painful quickly. Um, you got to keep your, you got to keep a very clear focus and then you can make it work. But uh, why go through that headache? Just have one frame, and uh, in this case, we would nest it inside the split view. Another thing to remember is this idea of retemplating. Um, there, there, there are a lot of pitfalls to retemplating any control. For example, I mean, we know keyboard support is important. Yep. Not everybody uses computers in the same way. I mean, that's just a reality. And so keyboard support is very important. Retemplating can spoil that away. You want to make sure the way that you uh, retemplate doesn't take away keyboard support. Um, and so we have an example here that shows how to do it and maintain all of this just fine. Um, another is um, retemplating can spoil accessibility. Again, people don't use computers in the same way. You might need a screen reader, and so that na that um, that reader may need to interact with your controls in a special through automation properties. And those those automation properties, you could spoil those away as well by retemplating a control and not including those. And so um, you know, just be careful. That's that's all this is as a consideration. It's also possible that in a smaller device, the number of items that you have in your menu button on your menu list actually overflow and you oh, don't yeah. have enough. So right. you need to start considering what are you going to do then if you can't see everything? Um, scroll bar? Mm. Probably. <laughs>